Hey all, Tom Moran here from Tom's Big Spiders. We're going to do something a little bit different this time around. A couple years ago, I attempted to start a new series called Tangled in Webs. It was going to be kind of like a monthly series in which I covered some of the goings-on in my tarantula room. Also, as part of the series, I did something called the Featured Species, which was supposed to be a little more in-depth look at certain tarantula species, their husbandry care, including some notes of where they originate from. Anyway, I love that part of it, but I never got back to the uh, Tangled in Web series. However, moving ahead, one of the things I want to do now that I've got some species that I've kept for quite some time, some that I've bred, is bring back this featured species type thing and do a little more work as far as the editing and the presentation of it. So I'm going to continue to do my raw videos. I love doing just the on-the-fly husbandry notes while doing rehousings. For me, it's more organic. Those are the type of videos I like to watch. But I also understand that people that, you know, YouTube's a big wide place out there and people that are just looking around for husbandry advice might look at that and kind of the very laid back way it's shot and move on. So we're going to do some of these moving ahead. I've created some new graphics. I've done a little bit more editing. Hopefully, if time allows, we can continue with this series. The idea is going to be focusing on species that I have a, a lot of experience on. And to make this one a little more special, we're going to focus on Caribbean Versicolor. And Philip from World of Spiders was actually nice enough to let me use some of his footage of them in the wild. He went, he recorded it. It's amazing footage, and his channel is absolutely spectacular. I've been spending a lot of time on channels that basically show these animals in their natural habitat. I don't get out of my own state even that much. And for me to actually see how they live just blows my mind. So I do want to throw some people his way. If you like tarantulas, if you love tarantulas, you want to see where they actually come from, what it looks like in the wild, their natural habitat, definitely check it out. World of Spiders, I'll obviously have his thing over here. And at the end of the video, I'll also encourage you to check it out because it really is good stuff. It's what I'm watching lately. So anyway, enough of me talking. Let's learn about the husbandry and some of the details behind Carabina Versicolor. Despite being very common and established in the hobby, there's perhaps no tarantula available right now, save maybe the T. blondi that causes owners more stress over the husbandry than the C. versicolor. When I first got into the hobby, I was immediately amazed by this gorgeous arboreal, which starts as a stunning blue sling and morphs into a fuzzy, multicolored adult. The C. versicolor has been one of my favorite spiders to grow up as it's beautiful and colorful in every stage of its life. The Caribbean of Versicolor hails from the island of Martinique, one of the Caribbean islands. With a tropical climate all year round, Martinique is generally hot and humid 12 months out of the year, with plenty of rain and sunshine during both its dry and wet seasons. This spider lives in the lush forests and banana plantations, creating its heavily webbed home in the crooks and hollows of trees and banana plants. For some amazing video of this spider in the wild, I encourage you all to check out the channel World of Spiders as he's got some fantastic footage of them. Stay tuned to the end of this video for a link to his channel and that video. Now, anyone researching this amazing species will likely find information that is frustratingly confusing and contradictory. On one side are old care sheets that still say this species is difficult to keep due to strict humidity requirements. However, keepers who have had success with this spider argue that humidity and moisture are not as important as good cross ventilation and that a stuffy, humid cage can prove a death sentence for this animal. Unfortunately, while focusing on the high heat and humidity of their natural habitat, some folks tended to ignore that the island usually enjoys air circulating winds for most of the year. Unfortunately, these dank enclosures resulted in constant mention of SADS, or Sudden Avic Death Syndrome, the name of the phenomena where a seemingly healthy avicularia, the versicolor's old genus, suddenly dies for no apparent reason. For a time, the message boards and chat groups were rife with stories of these little blue beauties curling up and dying suddenly and without an obvious cause. Many now believe that these deaths can be attributed to misguided husbandry. I picked up my first Caribbean Aversa color sling, which was about three quarters of an inch from Jamie's tarantula several years ago, and I was fortunate enough to get some great husbandry information from a keeper who had kept the Vicularia species for many, many years. As this species is arboreal and will settle in high ground even as a sling, you need an enclosure that offers more height than forest space. Originally, I chose to house my first girl in one of Jamie's arboreal spiderling enclosures or a modified AMAC box with a vent in the front. These clear rectangular cages sported that round vent in front and offered good ventilation, although no cross ventilation. Many folks also use the smaller clear AMAC boxes for theirs, which they ventilate well with holes on both sides. Slings are quite small and tend to struggle to settle into larger enclosures. Well ventilated dram bottles or even 5.5 ounce condiment cups were great for smaller slings. 32 ounce deli cups or something of a similar size work well for larger spiderlings. 
The slings I kept from pairing my female were kept in dram bottles before being moved to 32 ounce deli cups once they molted a few times. For substrate, cocoa fiber, topsoil, peat, or any combination of the three work great. Some even choose to mix some vermiculite in. I usually start my slings off on an inch or so of substrate. I also supply a piece of cork bark and fake plant leaves for cover and anchor points and to encourage webbing. This species will essentially construct its own home from webbing, so you need to provide it with anchor points to web to. Spiders that are not supplied with hiding spots and foliage tend to take residence up in the corner of their enclosures. This can be far from ideal with a top opening setup. My little versicolors were quick to create web funnels between the cork and the sides of the enclosures, and they spent most of their time in and around that hide. In the case of my first specimen, I noticed that she didn't seem to come down to the ground to hunt for prey. As a result, this was one of the only spiders I have ever tong fed using tweezers to feed our red runner nymphs. After several months of this, this cute little girl would actually come right to the edge of the funnel web whenever I opened her enclosure to take the item right from my tongs. Learned behavior? It sure seemed like it. Other keepers have also experienced the issue of their spiders not coming down to hunt, although it doesn't appear to be particularly common. Smaller slings will eat red runner nymphs, pinhead crickets, or any pre-killed prey. I've even used mealworm segments before with success. Just be sure to drop the pre-killed prey by the opening of their web cocoon and not on the ground. If they are hungry, they will find it. If the prey item, whether pre-killed or alive, is still there the next day, pull it out. As with all my slings, I fed mine twice a week to start, although once a week or even bi-weekly works for many. Pick a schedule that works for you. As always, tarantulas do well at room temperature, which for most of us is upper 60s to mid 80s Fahrenheit or around 20 to 29 degrees Celsius. For temperatures, my first sea versicolor was kept between 68 and 76 degrees during the winter and between 72 and 88 during the summer. I did not notice a large difference in growth rate between these two periods. In these temperatures, the species grows at a medium pace with mine going from 3 quarters of an inch to about 2.5 inches in 11 months time. Keep in mind that higher temperatures usually lead to faster metabolisms, so folks keeping their collections in warmer temperatures will likely experience faster growth. Now, about that humidity. Although the substrate started off moist, it soon dried out. As time went on, I would moisten one corner of the enclosure by dribbling water on the web and on the cocoa fiber about once a week. Misting works for other folks as well, and I would keep their small water dishes full at all times. Occasionally, I would see this specimen drink from water on the web. They appeared to thrive in these conditions, eating very well and molting every two months like clockwork. Even during the winter months, when my furnace was bringing humidity down to the teen, she still ate and molted regularly. Now, juveniles do well in enclosures between 2 quarts and 1 gallon, or 1.9 to 3.79 liters. I used the 1 gallon mainstay clear canister sold at Walmart for my first, and a 9 inch tall by 4.25 diameter clear acrylic cylinder for my newest juveniles. There are many outstanding choices available for enclosures, so use what works for you. Be sure that the enclosure offers plenty of cross ventilation though, and be sure to add a couple inches of substrate, some type of hide, cork bark flats or rounds work great, and fake plants or real foliage for anchor points. Also, be sure to include a water dish. In my experience, there's no need to obsess over moisture levels with older specimens. Once my Vic reached the juvenile stage, about 1.75 to 2 inches or 4.45 to 5 centimeters leg span or so, I stopped moistening the substrate and would only spritz the webbing inside of the enclosure when feeding her once a week. Juveniles are great eaters and will easily take down medium to large red runners, medium to large crickets, and smaller dubia roaches. Mealworms and superworms will also work, but you may want to supervise the feeding to make sure that they grab the prey and that it doesn't end up loose in the enclosure. Superworms can bite, so crushing the heads first is also prudent. This species gets to be about 5.5 inches or 14 centimeters diagonal leg span as an adult. Expect those grown up colors to show up around the 4 inch mark or so. This is when the C. carabina experiences one of its most profound color changes. Adults are fantastic and enthusiastic hunters taking down larger prey items with speed and ferocity. I feed my adult three large crickets once a week, although roaches and worms may also be used. For an adult enclosure, Exoterra Nano Talls work great, although they don't offer that cross ventilation that we really want to see. I've kept mine in one and it did perfectly fine. I currently have mine in a custom built 3.5 gallon or 13 and a quarter liter acrylic enclosure. Inverted 5 gallon aquariums and extra large critter keepers also seem to work quite well for them. If using a larger setup, be sure to provide ample hiding spots and foliage for cover and webbing. 
For keepers who want to try a bioactive setup, you'll want to be sure not to let the enclosure become too moist and stuffy. Make sure that you have excellent ventilation and use plants that thrive in drier environments like Peperomia, for example. This is one of the species that I had an opportunity to breed and I was fortunate enough to get about 100 dazzlingly blue slings from my girl. When pairing the male and female, I put the two enclosures next to each other and allowed the male to climb out and approach the female on his own. The two met outside the cages and there was just a bit of frantic scrambling before their first interaction. However, soon the female calmed down and they paired without incident. My female was bred in late November, laid her sack in December, and the spiderlings emerged in mid-March. My girl was an excellent mother and I chose to leave the sack with her. When breeding, keep in mind the slings are very tiny, so if you leave the sack with the mother, you have to make sure that there's no places the little slings can get out. Although I did my best to sling-proof this enclosure, we ended up having to take them away from her when I noticed one of them starting to get out of an open corner. Now, for the big question, is this a beginner species? Well, yes and no. Although the species is usually quite calm, beginners can struggle with the narrower band of husbandry as they wrestle with the conflicting husbandry information they find online. I usually encourage folks to get a bit of experience keeping the other so-called beginner species before attempting a C. versicolor. Also, although many folks report that their specimens are quite calm and tractable, temperament may vary from specimen to specimen and even from molt to molt. For example, my girl was quite calm for years, however she has become very skittish after her most recent molts. It's important to consider that this is a species that can jump as well, so those who handle have to be extra cautious that their hands-on time doesn't result in a deadly fall. Furthermore, Caribbean versicolor has type 2 urticating hairs that they can spread by rubbing their abdomens on you. I've heard folks talk about their spiders cuddling with them when they were, in fact, hairing them. Whoops! Does this mean that a beginner can't keep this amazing spider? Of course not. However, one interested in raising the C. versicolor sling should do his or her homework and be sure that the husbandry is accurate and spot on. Don't fall for those faulty care sheets or those fake humidity requirements, or else you'll probably end up with a stuffy enclosure and, unfortunately, a dead spider. So again, with C. versicolor, the main thing to pay attention to is that cross ventilation. More ventilation, generally speaking, the better. I know sometimes we freak out, think we're putting too many holes, but I found that as I get more and more into the hobby, I'm putting more and more holes in things. So, and that's mostly for the slings. It seems like the adults are pretty hardy overall, but slings and juveniles, that's where you get those, you know, the incidences of SADS or sudden Vic death syndrome. Again, it applies to Caribbean versicolor because Caribbean versicolor used to be a vicularia versicolor. But anyway, again, hope you guys like these kind of videos. I'm going to continue doing them. My goal is to probably do one or two a month. I will continue to do the raw videos or the ones like my classic videos. But I do want to do stuff that's a little more presentable for people that may be looking for, you know, really rock solid information on them instead of having to sit through an entire rehousing. Again, I want to extend a huge thank you to World of Spiders for giving me permission to use the clips of the Caribbean Versicolor in the wild. Again, I'm going to post a link to that video at the end of this one. So I hope you guys We'll go check it out. It's fascinating. It's amazing. He does a beautiful job and it's shot in 4K, so much better footage than what I've got in mind. And I hope you subscribe to him. A video here, him up here. Just an awesome channel. It's what I've been binge watching lately. And for folks who love tarantulas, there's nothing cooler than actually getting to see what they're like in the wild. So that'll do it for this one. Again, please feel free to comment. Love comments. I answer every single one of them. If you don't hear from me in a couple days, feel free to give me a little nudge. It means I probably missed it. As always, if you like my video enough to subscribe, you can subscribe to me by clicking a circle somewhere up here. Please check out World of Spiders and subscribe to him up here. I'm going to put the avicular versicolor, Caribbean versicolor video down here. And then I'm going to go ahead and put one of my videos over here. So it'll be all filled up. You can click on those, go see videos, go subscribe, all the good things that YouTube provides. As always, thanks so much for watching. We'll catch you guys next time.